So those will just continue to grow a little bit more? Yeah, and they'll probably be ready to harvest sometime late tomorrow. Because I always tell people with the grow kits, you, you got to harvest everything at once. Oh, you do? Basically, if you're growing it at home, you can monitor the growth of the grow kit every day and harvest the mushrooms as they're ready. OK. Yeah, we would print the label out at the same time as the packing slip, but now we're just going to do the packing slip, pack the order, and then basically print the label. I got this for, you know, almost free. I kind of saved it from going into a scrap yard. They were like, if you get this, because they offered the mixer to me for a thousand, they said, well, go ahead and throw in the autoclave. So, wow. so I got the- Is that the one that you have going through your wall? Yep, that's there? it, yeah. Wow, sweet. Yeah, man. What's in these big uh, things here? This, is, this is the soy hole. Do you get organic soy, or is it just regular soy? Just the regular non-GMO. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a second flush. It's a really good second flush. Yeah, you can tell the bag's a little loose. We'll go ahead and harvest this one too. Okay. Thanks, man. So I'll just harvest that real quick. It comes off pretty clean. So just making up some five pound boxes and we harvested these chestnuts earlier. So we'll put those in there. Do you find people prefer them bigger or smaller for chestnuts? Um, this one in particular prefers smaller fruiting bodies. He likes the whole mushroom to go into each dish to showcase the mushroom itself. Mm -hmm. And with the bigger ones, they basically have uh, less to go around for people to experience. So the bigger ones are sliced into you yeah. know, segments. Right. So it's not something that is preferred. I did have some really big ones come out of here, though. Yeah, I've been having that happen recently, too. Some really big ones. Do, yeah. you, do you notice any rhyme or reason why? I know when there's fewer mushrooms to like, with chestnuts specifically, when we put the block in there, if there's already some fruiting bodies developing inside the block close to where the incision is made, uh, maybe that fruit fruiting body will develop before even an initial pin set can yeah. start to form. We had that happen and like three or four mushrooms came out and they were the size of my arm. <laughs> so they might even be in this box. We might be able to find them. Um, this is a huge cluster right here. Beautiful mushroom. And these will be going to the Sheraton down, downtown, actually. So, <laughs> big chestnuts. Holy cow. Yeah, they can get pretty monstrous, depending on how many form. And this might be good for somebody that's looking for something that they could substitute for like a portobello, something similar, and just have like a better mushroom with an overall better flavor compared yeah. to that. So if you can use that for, some people love these. And I think they're awesome myself, but I like to have just like a diversity of different, um, different sizes and whatnot, uh, just because certain people like different things for different uses. Yeah. So. Can you fit five pounds of oysters in these boxes pretty? Um, these ones easy. are meant for three and a half pounds of oysters. Okay. And then they could do five pounds of uh, basically everything else, right. shiitake, lion's mane. Um, you can do like six pounds of shiitake in these pretty easily. I can't wait to start growing these well. <laughs> Those look really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Are you growing these right now? No, I I have a culture for them. Okay, but nice. But like I had mentioned, I didn't let them fruit long enough in the bag. Yeah. So when I went to heart, or put them into my grow room, they just got really short and squatty. Oh, okay. And I didn't get those long stems to them. Now we have some pink oysters growing. This is the Pleurotus dejamore. Uh, there's also the Pleurotus salmoneo ostraminius, which is more of the salmon, salmon colored oyster. Uh, the Plotus Dejamore, of course, produces the uh, deepest colors, and I think it's the best one to showcase uh, the color of the mushroom. A little mix case. I'll hand this off to the uh, delivery driver, and we'll get these mushrooms out of here. So let's say this is my 10 by five on the one side, just I have my uh, tote outside. Yeah. So my air is coming in this way. Okay, so you have your tote outside of the tent. Tote outside, the fog is pumping in over there. And then picture this as like a rectangle though because it's a 10 by five. Mm -hmm. So fog is coming in over there. And then over in this corner is where I have my 
exhaust. Okay. So I used to have the humidifier on the outside of the tent, and I just didn't like it because the water would end up getting trapped in the uh, exhaust, or the intake tube in the exhaust tube. Um, so I ended up going back inside the tent. It's also, yeah, just become a pool of water inside the duct. So this is a mild version of what's been happening. Like the sides, the sides produce nice, nice fruit. Could it be wetting? Could they be getting wet right there? Do you think that could be it? Yeah. Like too humid of, a, of an environment, and then water just sits yeah, on the top. Because I know I see you growing them out sideways, and ninety percent of people do grow them out sideways. Some people do, so and maybe. that's what I did notice when I was growing them like cutting the bag and growing them right on top of the bag. I noticed uh -huh. they just didn't develop the nice icicle along, like they didn't have the definition that I usually get when I fruit them off the side. And yeah. I think, you know, part of it's because water doesn't get a chance to settle on the mushrooms as much. And also just like the gravity right. of just hanging off the side mm -hmm. and growing kind of like similar as they do in nature off the sides of trees. Get those you know, nice spines on nice them. Nice spines, yeah. nice, nice mushroom fruit body development. Yeah. Um, so that's what works out, and I'll show you how I set the 5x10 up. Uh, so I used to have the humidifier right here, mm -hmm. and it had a hose hooked in through the side where it pumped the humidity in, mm -hmm. but I just noticed it just didn't, I didn't like it. So I put it back inside the tent, and it's on a dolly on wheels, so it could be moved around. Yeah. And then the exhaust is all the way in that back corner right there, opposite of the humidifier, okay. and that just creates the perfect grow environment. So Do you have happens. to grow my taki specifically by themselves? In this um, own room. You would like, yeah. Well, you don't have to. I've gotten away with growing them in the other rooms. Typically, uh, they don't like the fluctuations of temperature that you'll get with a lot of other strength. Well, that I get with the other rooms. The intake is actually not connected directly to outside um, because the outside air kind of fluctuates in temperature. Yeah. And it gets really cold in the morning and average temperatures in the day. So it's just bringing in air from the facility, and then the intake for the outdoors is actually just piped up in the top of the warehouse just to okay. kind of lower CO2 levels. It felt decently cool in here. What's the temp? The temp in here is like around 67, 68. Okay. okay. Yeah, a little cooler than actually in the warehouse. What do you keep uh, your humidity at in all your tents? I'm in the 90s. I try to. See, that's, that's what's crazy to me because I kept mine like high 80s and that lion's mane was getting that, okay. that weird growth to it. And I thought it was too much humidity, but I like to do a lot of humidity at the beginning, and then you could try to, um, once you get good mushrooms to grow, you could bring it down to the low 80s. The Depends, tough. because you're in the bay, so yeah. your environment's already more humid than mine right. is, so I basically am trying to condition my air all the time due to us having only like a 10% relative humidity. Yeah. So for you, you might need to just, you know, dial, dial in your humidity back. due to your location. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to take him back there real quick and show him it. It's something that probably won't be on camera, though. So let's go check it out. Cool. So you have the two different labs? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now with my setup is do I have enough space to have two labs? Really? I would, I would much How rather. How big is your setup? Um, well, it's going to be like 1,400 square foot. Okay. So yeah, you probably don't need two labs. I just have one lab per facility to help um, take the load off for how big the uh, place okay. is. Because mm -hmm, there would be times with the other lab where I used to do everything in the other lab, but the lab would be like overloaded with substrate for production, and then also I'd need to get in there and make spawn, do petri dishes, and I'd be sitting there waiting for a substrate to cool down before I can even get in. Are they both positive pressured? Yeah. Your filters are always running for both yeah. of them? Well, one of them is really only when uh, it'll run for a week at a time sometimes, mm -hmm. but I can turn it off and clean the lab, do maintenance on the filter, the pre filters on the outside of the mm -hmm. labs. This lab has a different uh, positive pressure system. It actually has two two by two flow hood um, units installed into the wall. Mm -hmm. Then it has basically three flow hoods inside of the lab that are just like recirculating the air and mm -hmm. uh, you know providing sterile workspace. Yeah. So I think that's where I was trying to figure out what to do because I w obviously want to have the po the lab positive pressured, mm -hmm. but I wanted to have just like a, a culture in yeah. grain lab. I separate from like separate. the inoculation lab? Maybe building a small lab would be beneficial just for you to do petri dishes, liquid cultures, grain yeah, maybe. spawn. That's what I'm doing with this one. It's really helped out and that's just a bulk substrate lab. Yeah. And then I can inoculate substrate in there. Okay. So we'll go in here. I have some uh, more suit coverings right here. Cool. On the autoclave. 
are looking at some lion's mane in the fruiting stage, and we went ahead and side fruited these. Well, they've been here for almost a week, so they'll be ready for harvest probably by tomorrow. They develop pretty quickly once put in the grow room, and uh, yeah, produce these wonderful pom-pom-like or brain-like uh, formations. This is the HE3. Some of this is HE1. What is the difference between the HE3 and the HE1? The HE3 is more of like the pom-pom uh, like formations and it produces really well. It's a, a really heavy commercial yielding strain producing like three to four pounds uh, on the first flush. And the HE1 is kind of similar in the way it yields. It's a heavy yielding commercial strain, really reliable, um, three pounds plus per, per first flush. And then it has like a brain-like formation, uh, real dense meaty-like mushrooms mm -hmm. that are really good, great for distribution, great for chefs. Um, I see that Chefs tend to like the HE3 and the HE1s due to the meatiness of the mushroom, the density, and then the fact that they can withstand distribution and, and shipping and stuff like that. They're, they're just good options. Oh, this one's about to pop. So yeah, we can see this one has like the smaller teeth and uh, kind of like some brainy-like development. Really cool mushroom itself. And then after this first flush, will you fruit again from the top? I'll basically fold the bag up and, and fruit it from the side. Yeah, you, these ones are like second flush right here. The bag's gotten a little bit smaller. We could see that the bag's shrunk a little bit. We ended up folding the, the top back up and just making a nice little diagonal cut. And then at that point, the mushroom just keeps growing. And uh, they do produce nice heads of mushrooms throughout the second, third flushes. I've even seen them go up to the fifth flush, still getting a nice little head of mushrooms. But if your production is, uh, allowing you could just simply you know like we do we replace them usually by the third flush well yeah that's it in a nutshell for the grow room uh fruiting bodies Gonna wash wash our uh, hands real quick and get ready to go unload the atmospheric sterilization machines. And how much substrate you run? And do you just run these right here? Oh yeah, they they all get ran in this room. Okay. They get hooked up right here. I have outlets for them. Yeah. They can hold around 640 pounds of substrate per cook. Yeah, so. I have I have the same one. Oh, you do? Yeah. Nice. I just didn't know how many of these you ran like a day. Oh, three. Three a day. Three at a time. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, basically you can do a lot of processing that way of substrate. So I, I kind of just, you, you work with these things, so you know how it is, man. Oh, yeah, you spray them, spray them down. down. I'm cheap and I use bleach, though. Oh, you do? Yeah. I've used it before, a too. A 10% bleach. Yeah. Um, it works. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, I mean. It just leaves a residue. Maybe it does. It builds up. I like the isopropyl alcohol for just wiping things down, spraying down sterilizers mm -hmm. as well as racks. I yeah. used to use bleach a long time ago on all my racks that I unload onto. But like I said, they eventually leave a, a heavy residue after time, so you 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 know you do have to wipe them down. Alcohol is just easy for me. It is expensive though. It's like twenty bucks a gallon. Where do you okay? So do you just order those through like Amazon or something? I used to get them through Uline, but now I found a place right down the street from my uh, farm that I can just go pick them up by the gallon. That's oh, sweet. And they sell them for like twenty bucks each. Twenty bucks a gallon. How often do you um, clean out the bottoms of these? Every time. Every time. Or like really clean them. Because so, I just drain the water after every cook and put fresh water in. Yeah. Every, let's say like every month or so, I put a gallon of vinegar into the sterilizers and okay. let it sit for about six hours. Uh -huh. Then after that, I can just rinse them out and any kind of buildup just falls right off and it cool. becomes like a brand new drum. That's good to know. So you never have to actually get down inside of there. No, I used to when I first <laughs> got them. I got in there with a steel scrubber, scrubbing it up. And then I was like, man, there has to be a better way to do this. And then... Uh, I went to the store and got a gallon of uh, vinegar. Uh -huh. Well, the next morning I came back and rinsed them out and they just were shiny and brand new. Nice. So. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna get a lot of good info today, but that helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I get down inside there and I oh, scrub yeah. it and it's just so much work. Yeah, the vinegar just, you know, basically you, just takes care of it. Do you take the grates out when you pour the vinegar in? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, I take the grates out. I basically just pour the vinegar in and then I can rinse out the, the bottom. Any so kind of build up, I could tilt the the sterilizer and then yeah. just kind of pour it out this valve right here. Okay. 
one thing the Bubba's Barrel rep did warn me when I bought one of these. Make sure you're tall enough to reach the bottom if you buy the 150 gallon one. I'm about three centimeters tall enough to reach the bottom bag. Uh, and I'm 5'10", so if you're shorter than 5'10", find a friend that's over 5'10". Better yet, find a mic that's over six foot. I just started growing mushrooms. It'll be a year in February. And I kind of just dove into it, learning all different sides of it from watching these YouTube videos of different guys. Hearing so many different approaches, all of which might work, but everybody's situation's a little bit different. You're fruiting in different sized spaces. You see these guys growing in these big grow rooms with perfect humidification, perfect airflow. And then you're at home growing in a five by five tent. You're trying to pack it full of as many bags as you think you can. That was one thing I struggled with is I tried to put way too many bags in there. Couldn't exchange the air fast enough for how much CO2 was producing. It's just trying to find your balance of your airflow to humidity level to um, managing the CO2 in there, um, all dependent on what size tent you have. Uh, I would say that was definitely the trickiest part. But I think doing consultations or just like trying to get onto other people's farms to just have another perspective, like it's gonna open up different angles to your mind to see it in a different way and like, oh wow, like I don't do it that way, but that might help me.